Okay, welcome everyone to tonight's webinar, Observing Our Environment with Feathered Friends. My name is Lindsay Glasner. I'm the K-12 K Outreach Coordinator uh, for the Birds of Program at the Cornell Lab Ornithology. Joining us in the chat window is our amazing education specialist, Kelly Schaefer. She will be answering any and all of your questions in the chat window or flagging me down to make sure I get those questions answered um as we move on tonight she'll also be sharing helpful links in the chat window too this webinar is being recorded um, and we will make sure all those links are available in the youtube video this will be converted to in the description of that youtube video so <clears throat> you'll have to forgive both kelly and i it seems that we are now coming down with some nasty coughs so hopefully we won't stumble too much tonight for those of you who are unfamiliar with our webinars, we are using the platform Zoom, um, and we try and make our webinars interactive if possible. So we'll be using the chat window. Uh, the chat window may be somewhere up in one of your corners. You'll either say chat or look like a chat bubble. It may also be hidden behind a dot, dot, dot button if you kind of hover at the top. When you click that chat window, it'll be easiest if you just dock it on the side and you do that by exiting the full screen. When you exit the full screen, your chat window will show up on the right-hand side. We do ask that if you plan on being active in the chat window, which is quite fun, I will say, um, please select to everyone or all participants. That way other people can um, see what your comments are. Now, where in the world are you joining us from? If you can, let us chest out that chat window. Let us know uh, where you're coming from today, what type of educator you are, uh, and what age group you teach, so to say. That way we can see if everybody's using the chat window correctly. Carla, welcome. Southern Indiana, your homeschool educator. Tina from Virginia, pre-K through four. Phoebe, Connecticut, K through eight, Washington State, West Virginia, Minnesota, lots of places. Oh, we have a busy group tonight. Nice. Seeing a lot of diversity of age groups, diversity of types of educators between environmental education, formal classroom teachers, homeschools, interpretive naturalists. Excellent. Well, welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. Kelly and I are specifically from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. We are based in Ithaca, New York, uh, not New York City. Most people get confused by that. We're more uh, central, southern tier type New York City, New York City, <laughs> central southern tier, southern tier New York. We're about four and a half hours away from New York City, uh, but we get to work at this gorgeous building here at the Lab of Ornithology, and we are a mission-driven institution that is, our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. Now, specifically, Kelly and myself are with the Birds of K-12 program here. So we take all the knowledge and research that's happening at the Lab of Ornithology to develop innovative resources and provide trainings that builds science skills while inspiring young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. Again, uh, my name is Lindsay Glasner. Kelly will be monitoring the chat window. If you have any questions at all, type those questions into the chat window and Kelly will be happy to um, answer any of them or again, flag me down for any reasons. Now, with BIRDS, with what we really do are primarily focus on two categories. We develop curriculum resources and we also provide both online and in-person trainings. Um, this obviously is one of our online trainings. However, if you're interested in attending one of our in-person trainings, what I highly recommend if you like what you hear tonight is consider attending our summer educator retreat. It's summer 2018 in July. I wanna say July 18th to the 21st but Kelly will put in the correct dates and link in the chat window. Um, but it's a really fun and amazing experience, so I highly encourage you to check that out. Now, today we are really focusing on this concept of feeding birds and how we can connect kids to nature. So first I wanna just ask you guys in the chat window, why should we even be feeding birds in the first place? 
So share your thoughts as to either why you try and feed birds or what you see as the advantage of feeding birds. To attract them so we can observe them, providing food sources that may have been eliminated to them. Potentially for cold weather, aesthetics, absolutely, Kathy. The beauty of them. Alan, that's great, having some form of family entertainment. Uh, talking about family entertainment, it's definitely seemed to, for both Kelly and I, have attracted our parents into, oh, yeah. into getting onto our uh, love of birds. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kelly, does your cat Bromley like watching birds? <laughs> Walk him on his leash. Yeah. <laughs> uh, food source replenishment, close observation for identification purposes. Um, looking at potentially variety of migration patterns. So yeah, there are a diversity of reasons of why we can feed birds. And you guys are really hitting the nail on the head with a lot of these. Um, one of them mentioned here is to provide a food source if you live anywhere like we do in upstate New York, this might be a common scene you get. Where, I mean, granted, this a common scene. We this is not New York. This is the UK. <laughs> Kelly's laughing at me right now. It's a good snowy blizzard picture where you we can just get a foot of snow and you get concerned potentially about how wildlife can survive. Yes, they're naturally adapted to survive, but it doesn't hurt or harm them to help provide alternative food sources. Uh, but also, as many of you guys have mentioned, a feeder brings the bird to you. And that um, action of the birds being able to watch them up close and in person is really a marvelous opportunity to start that nature connection for youth. Now, with Bird Sleuth, you really focus on three categories of resources, I'll say, to take students uh, and educators through the process of making a natural connection. Just first inspiring you to really appreciate uh, their local environment. From that appreciation, they can start making more observations and eventually lead those observations into um, making a difference by contributing those observations to citizen science. And then finally, from that process of citizen science, as they're making those observations, questions are naturally going to start arising. So then not just making these observations, but following through on those questions and going and doing a full inquiry process. And this is what we're really focusing on with Bird Sleuth, is how we can work with you as educators and help you take your students through this nature connection to citizen science to inquiry. And many of the level of your youth that you work with may be at different stages, and our resources are adapted to meet those different stages. Specifically, we'll be focusing on um, the nature connection aspect and the citizen science, but we'll also just touch briefly on the inquiry portion of things tonight. Now, I've said the word citizen science quite a few times. It's both in the Birth Sleuth's mission as well as the Cornell Labs mission. So again, we're gonna use that chat window. I'm gonna ask you guys, could you provide me a definition or some key words that you think of when you hear the word citizen science? And again, I'm just gonna quickly ask for those of you who may have joined us a little late, um, if you could just make sure you're selecting um, send to all attendees or to everyone. Okay, so when we're thinking about citizen science, the word observer comes up, um, gives people a chance to explore nature, students engage in investigations and observation in nature, citizens making observations to assist scientists, observations contributed by lay people, uh, not necessarily professionals. Absolutely, becoming part of nature. Citizens being scientists, wonderful. Yeah, when we think of citizen science, you guys are approaching many different aspects of citizen science. When I look at this image here, um, in many of our in-person trainings, I'll just show this image without any context. And I'll ask educators what they think they're looking at. 
And oftentimes they think of it as light pollution. And I really appreciate the fact that when you look at this image, you truly gain a grasp of the entire globe. And the fact that every single one of those dots is an observation of birds uh, submitted to the eBird Citizen Science Project that we have at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And that just shows the extent of the citizens of the world, people everywhere sharing observations of natural events. And what makes citizen science important is the fact that these people are following basic scientific protocols. And with that massive data that's coming in, we're really forming one of the world's largest research teams. It's a partnership between these citizens of the world, between everyday people and the scientists to answer these real world questions. And so citizen science uh, is really a massive global effort to develop these databases so that we can better understand the natural world. Now there are citizen science projects in a diversity of topics. And they range anywhere from being completely outdoors to completely online. They can provide uh, one or two supplemental activities to full curriculum projects. You can do them just one time only, or you can do uh, a long extensive project. There really is a diversity of opportunities available. Now, we are the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, so we're a little biased when it comes to our citizen science projects and the fact that we focus on birds specifically. At the Lab of Ornithology, we have six citizen science projects, and they're all going to range between uh, differences of type of data that's collected or when the data is collected. For example, Habitat Network down on the bottom right, that's actually a citizen science project where you don't submit bird observations, but instead you're tracking habitat of, of uh, your local area. And that habitat we can then use to help better understand bird population and habitat trends. So with our citizen science projects, there really are diversity of means we can study the world. But when you start combining citizen science and feeding birds, it really uh, becomes a powerful educational tool. It's exciting and real world and the fact that students are able to study wild animals. For the most part, you can um, partake in citizen science projects for free or minimal cost. And when feeding birds done right, it's also going to be uh, potentially lower costs. You can help birds by contributing those databases, uh, by contributing those feeding, the food aspect. And you can also spark kids' curiosity by again, asking those, nat uh, those questions that naturally arise. And again, you're connecting them to a local environment. So the big emphasis we want to talk about today uh, for this webinar for educational purposes is our hot off the press, six months in the making. I'm shaking with excitement the fact that this was just released today, Feathered Friends. Um, Feathered Friends, we've had it now probably for four years, I want to say, um, and each year we've been getting feedback from educators and we have um, compiled all that feedback to really develop a whole new series of amazing lessons. Now, the context of Feathered Friends, I'll lay down for you guys, is sponsored by uh, Pennington Wild Bird Food. And they have been supporting us over the last five years to help distribute thousands of bird feeders that you see pictured there, as well as help disseminate um, the Feather Friends. So it's been downloaded over 10,000 times um, across the nation. And people are really happy what it is. It's nine months of activities. Each month is a different topic around birds. But we really wanted to expand that further. We wanted to bring in more literacy connections. We wanted to focus more on bird identification and um, bring in more of the inquiry aspect and the STEM skills. And so we've added a whole new lesson. Uh, we have aligned everything to the next generation science standards. And we really have refined Feathered Friends. So for any of you guys who had this before, 
I would say a good 60% is different than past years. And what's still there has um, been edited and refined. We're really excited about this. Now, you, uh, Feather Friends is designed specifically for the elementary age group, K through five. However, anybody is able to um, download the resource or adapt it for their needs. And you're also welcome to receive a free window bird feeder uh, for attending this online training as well. And Kelly will share the link to the bird feeder in the chat window. Okay, there. Okay. Oh, she already should. No, you already should link to Pennington on the Pennington site. It has a link to the bird feeder there, so you're good. Um, so what what we are really focusing on, especially since this is targeting the elementary age group, is to think about how we can first uh, start that nature connection with the younger audience. And for any of you guys, whether you work with younger or older audiences you may have your students suffering from what we call blurred bird blindness. Uh, you know, you take the kids outside, they may be tired, they may not notice anything, or you yourself may be suffering from bird blindness saying, yeah, sure, I wanna, wanna teach the kids about birds, but there's just no birds in my area. And when it comes to feeding birds, we want you to take a look again, because birds are everywhere, and as soon as you start feeding the birds, as soon as you start doing some activities within Feather Friends, you and your students will start to recognize that there really are a diversity of birds in all the habitats across the United States. And the first thing we start off with to successfully participate in citizen science, but also to notice that bird, is having each month focus on some kind of identification key. So of all the 10 months we have, every month, I think it's 11 months actually, whatever September to June is, um, <laughs> we have a bird ID of the month. So these can range from very common birds that you'll find all across the United States. Uh, American goldfinch, for example, this you're gonna find across most of the Northern United States. Uh, we have American crows, American robins. I just listed all the American birds there. Um, you'll have to forgive me, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, <laughs> so they're all relevant birds. They're all relevant birds and chickadees. No chickadees. No chickadees. Um, European starlings, uh, house sparrows, house finches versus a purple finch. So some of the months we do have two birds to do some bird ID challenges like the house finch and purple finch. But they'll always have some fun facts around it and focus on some bird identification. From there, it will help you start to work on identifying some of those birds that may be visiting your bird feeder. Now, the theme really is for our feather friends focusing on how you can feed birds and use that as a teaching tool. Now, there are diversity types of feeders out there and different feeders will attract different types of birds. So it's really a, a great opportunity for your students to start investigating the world of feeder birds. Now, a classic feeder that many people are familiar with seeing is down here on the bottom left, a hummingbird feeder. Hummingbird feeders are great because hummingbirds in general really pique the curiosity of most people. They're incredibly small, incredibly beautiful, and incredibly fast. Um, the difficult part is Hummingbird feeders really require a lot of maintenance, and depending on where you live in the United States, you may not have hummingbirds in your school or educational site very long. For those of us especially living up north, our hummingbirds have already been long gone, and so instead it's also really good to look at the diversity of bird feeders. For example, a classic tube feeder on the top left, you're going to be attracting a lot of finches, um, and a lot of smaller feeder birds. You may want to try and consider a sewer cage if you really want to get the insectivorous birds like the um, wrens and woodpeckers. Or you can go for more of a small hopper or a platform feeder. These are going to get you a greater diversity of birds that will just come towards a flat surface. And one feeder that's not shown here that most people don't consider the feeder is the ground. 
um, the seed that falls below your bird feeder will also help feed a diversity of birds as well, like your doves, um, your jays, and your robins, potentially down towards the lower ground area. So when it comes to feeding about birds, just consider, you know, what kind of birds do you want to attract? As mentioned, you guys are all welcome to receive a free Pennington window bird feeder. Um, it's just a $6 shipping charge to cover our shipping it to you guys, but the feeder just goes right onto your window and um, it does attract some great feeder birds, similar to what you get at a tube feeder. That said, when I had this up at my house, I had a Northern Cardinal who was very diligent trying to get onto this feeder. Um, it, it's a little too small for a Northern Cardinal, but he was diligent. He was trying to, he was going to get it. So you're likely going to get more birds like chickadees, goldfinches, um, coming and visiting this feeder. Sparrows, yep, absolutely. So another opportunity as well, if you want to diversify the types of feeders that you can do instead of buying feeders, within the Feather Friends activities, we also provide um, DIY bird feeders. Here's one example, a simple make a perch feeder. This is a recycled bird feeder, so to say. It's a great activity during the uh, Earth Day time period, but it's as simple as just using a recycled water bottle, um, cutting the little slots, using some kind of spoon or dowel, and just hanging that up. It's a very simple recycled bird feeder um, aspect, and it just replicates a two feeder as well. So we have a couple of these types of DIY bird feeders within the um, Feather Friends activities. Another one is uh, cookie cutter bird feeders, which are always fun too. Now, based off of the type of bird feeder you have, that will influence the types of birds that you attract, as we discussed. But also consider the seeds that you may um, be using as well. Oftentimes when we do our trainings for educators, many of them are asking, you know, what type of seed do you recommend? And we try and respond back saying, well, what do you want to attract towards your feeder? Uh, feeder investigations are encouraged throughout Feathered Friends and with many of our resources. We encourage you guys to have kids um, take some of the leadership take control of these opportunities to connect with nature as it will really solidify um, their passion for the wildlife that they see. So by allowing them to decide what feeder do they want to hang up or where should it be hung up or what type of seed should we fill it with does give them that power. Here's a really great um, diagram that one of our citizen science projects, uh, Project Theater Watch, developed. They actually used the data from their citizen science project where, they, where people were observing the birds that were visiting their bird feeders. And based off of the seed that they used, they created this chart to better understand which type of seed birds prefer. And if you look at the top here, our greatest preferred seed all across the board is sunflower. These are black oil sunflower seeds. So if you're somebody like me who doesn't want to show preference to any birds, uh, I highly recommend black oil sunflower seed. And that is the largest seed that will fit into the window bird feeder that we're going to be having. Um, however, you know, I've had worked with classrooms who they really want to focus on attracting their state bird. So they'll specifically choose a feeder um, and seed that will solely attract their state bird, which is really uh, another cool opportunity to do. Again, focus on um, what types of birds you want to attract and then try and find the combination of seeds and feeder that work. Now, one of the best ways to do that, instead of just doing a whole bunch of research, is to actually use one of our interactives through Project Feeder Watch. And I'm gonna try and share my screen here. Zoom allows that, so let's see if we can make that work. And Kelly, can you see my, yes you can. So we're gonna to go to feederwatch.org, and this is Project Feeder Watch's website. And 
what we have is a nice learn tab here and you'll see the same icon that was just on my webinar it's called common feeder birds interactive and this is a really great interactive i highly recommend where you can pick and choose your region your wintering region i should say uh, the food type you're providing and the feeder type and based off of that it'll provide you a full selection of birds that you're likely going to see um, the list is not uh, exhausted however it's a really um, decent list so if we kelly and i were currently living in the northeast and outside my house i have a simple small hopper feeder looks like that and i currently have black oil sunflower seeds in it so using these categories these are some birds that i may actually see in my area now i can tell you right now i have a lot of dark eyed juncos in my backyard and they love to eat all the seed that's at the bottom of my bird feeder i also have a lot of song sparrows and my favorite visitor is probably the tufted titmouse so what i just did is i just clicked on the image of the tufted titmouse and by doing so it provides me a lot more information about this bird gorgeous picture um, the different regions that you might find the tufted titmouse as well as the types of food that it will actually eat and the feeders that will visit now for those of you who aren't aware of our online field guide all about birds you can learn even more about this bird the top the titmouse at the bottom here by clicking the visit the all about birds page all about birds is the cornell labs online field guide and it's really a very amazing resource um, you can do what i love to do is um, having side-by-side -side comparisons of species pictures so seeing the difference between tufted titmouse and a black crested titmouse or brittle titmouse i can just go on and on about this but i digress <clears throat> this is a marvelous resource that i highly recommend <clears throat> excuse me and um is a great tool for you to work with your students to try and figure out okay if we are in this region <clears throat> we have this bird feeder and are providing this type of seed what birds are we likely to see? So this can also be a good starting point if you are unfamiliar with the feeding birds in your area. Now, one of the common concerns, and I saw this mentioned briefly earlier today, was um, about window strikes. And with the bird feeder we're providing is a window bird feeder. Now, window strikes are the third large the third leading cause to bird deaths in, per year in our nation and it's unfortunate however what's really great about our bird feeders is actually they are helping prevent bird strikes and when it comes to bird strikes there was a really amazing student group um, these were sixth graders in toledo ohio who did a full on study around bird strikes in our area and how the windows were leading to uh, higher deaths or um, stuns of birds compared to a part of their building which didn't have as many windows and this is a really great video um, if kelly wants to share the link to that on the chat window feel free to kelly however one more i i don't want to say more professional but a, a study that more people tend to find um with a google search would be this climate all study done in 2004 and this is specifically focusing on what is the distance that is safe versus deadly when it comes to bird collisions and their study they found that when birds are actually um colliding with window strikes from feeders it's actually when feeders are further away from the house or from the building so to say and that's because it's not when birds are flying to a bird feeder they're fairly accurate when they're flying to a bird feeder they know exactly where their bird feeder is and they're not going to have any issues however it's when birds are flying away from a bird feeder the further they are from the feeder and from sorry the further the feeder is from the house 
that allows the bird to gain enough momentum to actually cause harm. So if a bird feeder is right around the one meter mark, it only has a meter to gain enough momentum to um, really cause not that much damage if it does collide with the window. However, if it was 10 meters apart, around 30 feet away from the house, that's 30 feet for that bird to gain enough momentum to actually cause damage. Can you not see it? No, that's good. Okay. So when we look at our window bird feeders, because um, the bird feeder is actually right up against the window, it's not allowing the birds at all to um, gain any kind of momentum to harm themselves as they're leaving the feeder. You, every once in a while, may hear a wing just clip the window as it flies away from the feeder, but it's completely harmless to the bird. Ooh. Squirrels. Oh, squirrels. Oh, squirrels. Who doesn't love a good squirrel? Now, for any of you who are avid um, bird feeders, for any of you who are avid bird nerds, you either are probably on two extremes. You either hate squirrels completely and just wish they would never rage your bird feeder, or you've just given up on that battle and decide, you know what, I'm just not going to even worry about it. Because when it comes to squirrels, it's, it can be very frustrating. Um, for those of you who are educators, I encourage you to look at squirrels as a great learning opportunity. Um, again, one of our main goals is to connect kids to nature. Obviously, birds can be a great tool to connect kids to nature, but so can squirrels. So um, think of it as an opportunity that, you know, you're feeding the squirrels instead, but you're also making an impact on those kids. If you are somebody who wishes to reduce your squirrel consumption at your bird feeder, um, <laughs> two options. First, consider using a baffle or a squirrel proof feeder. Um, I will say there's nothing that's actually squirrel proof. <laughs> The only thing that I've really found to be successful is if you keep your bird feeder about 10 feet away from any kind of jumping platforms at all. Um, personally, when I used the window bird feeder, it was in association with two other bird feeders that I had in the same vicinity. The squirrels always found my other two bird feeders a lot easier to access, so they never bothered my window bird feeder. But then I also was somebody who just gave up on trying to deter squirrels, and oh well, because that was a battle I knew I was going to lose. But even if you do have squirrel-proof feeders, like I said, there really is no such thing as a squirrel-proof feeder. Um, I've seen slinkies, potentially. But I don't think they figure it out too. They figured the slinkies out too. Um, if you found any really great squirrel proof advice, let us know. But as far as we're concerned, I don't believe there's any formal how do you solve your squirrel problem. You can, yeah, I mean, there's techniques. There's feeding them away from the bird feeder with something like corn or peanuts. Or, uh, peanuts are expensive, corn's cheap. Um, or choosing something like safflower seeds, which squirrels yeah. aren't crazy about, but they will develop a taste for eventually. There's a diversity of strategies. Um, what I would recommend, we do have bird notes. This is something that was published a, a while back now, but there's still a lot of good information that's happening uh, that's in this. So it's just a simple online PDF that you guys can find. And again, Kelly will share the link to that in the um, chat window, but we'll also, oh, she already shared the link to that in the chat window, um, but it'll also be in the YouTube description as well. Okay, I'm going to pause one moment and let you guys just take in this beautiful picture of a bird feeder station. What are we observing in this image? Feeding the birds, birds. <laughs> yes, I like that, Pamela. 
housing development in the background, overpopulation. That's a bird feeder that would bring a variety of birds, a nice field, multiple types of feeders, an urban bird feeding area. Predators at the feeders. Yeah. So, you know, I completely agree with you guys. This seems to have a great diversity of feeders. We have a small platform, a couple platform feeders down here at the bottom. Uh, looks like several suet cages, some two feeders that are attempting to be squirrel proof, another two feeder that's less squirrel proof. Um, but we don't see any birds in this image. And it's likely because we have an American Kestrel here. And Kelly, what bird is that? Probably a sharpshin down here. Um, now, this is another good discussion point to have with youth. I've worked with um, several educators who have either set up feeding stations like this or just have a simple bird feeder outside a window, and they always tell me their favorite moment. Aside from kids getting excited about seeing the birds, is when they have that one raptor, the Cooper's hawk or the Sharpshin hawk, swooping down in front of the window. All the kids gasp and the birds fly away in fright. And it, it's really, they've always said that's a memory where some of their students will come back and say, that is a memory that they will never forget. And when it comes to looking at feeders and habitats like this, though it is a really cool experience, sometimes you don't necessarily want to have these predators hanging around your bird feeders 24 seven because your seed may not actually go anywhere. You're not gonna have birds starting to come eat the seed. So it's an opportunity to figure out, okay, what do we do in these situations? And how can we look at potentially this habitat to um, potentially improve it or help the birds? If you do have an, uh, a situation where you have predators like um, a Sharpshin hawk or Cooper's hawk who are lingering around your feeders, what you can do, take your feeders down, leave them down for a few days and let those predators move on. Once they've moved on after a few days, you can put your bird feeders back up and let them come. Another option is to critically look at your habitat as well. And somebody made a comment, it looks like a nice field over here. You know, with all of these shrubs, it may be providing a decent amount of cover for the birds. And habitat is a big component within the Feathered Friends lessons. Um, the entire, I want to say, third month of these lessons, November, is focused on what's in a habitat. And focusing on this idea of birds need food, water, cover, and space. And this is a screenshot here. I'll show you um, how the beginning of those lessons look like with the title, the big idea, the learning objectives, and how it's aligned to the standards. But we want to focus on this habitat component when it comes to feeding birds. Now, here's a great study that's been done by third graders. And um, these guys were done in New Jersey, where one of their educators actually attended a workshop of ours and received this Pennington feeder. Um, this paying two feeder. They were very excited. They put up the bird feeders, they put out bird seed, and they waited. And they waited. And they waited. And after a few weeks, they realized that birds just weren't coming to their bird feeders. So um, their educator, Janet, she really took the time to have the kids sit down and, and brainstorm what is happening. And they were coming up with ideas. Could it be the feeder? Could it be the seed? Um, and they were really focusing on this idea of habitat and realized there really wasn't enough cover in this area. So the kids went and did some background research. They participated in the eBird Citizen Science Project and went on weekly bird walks to understand what birds are currently in their area. They also did raptor studies. Uh, looking at the types of bird of prey that are found in their area. And then based off of this background information, they were able to then develop a plan of what they wanted their bird habitat to look like. So they wanted to include that cover component, but then they also thought about things like water sources as well. From there, the kids then received a small grant from us to implement this habitat. So they not only improved the windowsill that was where their feeders originally were, but the nice um, garden beds that were in the little courtyard. 
And what came from a, a small observation the kids made in the fall turned into a year-long project that by the springtime, the kids had created this full bird habitat and actually started having birds visit their feeder station, which for us is a really great cumulative uh, start to finish story, which we really like. And again, they were being citizen scientists. So during that project, they were observing birds for the eBird Citizen Science Project. That's our largest citizen science project. Now the month of February in Feathered Friends is focused on this concept of citizen science and having kids participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count. For those of you who aren't aware, the Great Backyard Bird Count is a citizen science project, an international one. It's a partnership between the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the National Audubon Society, and Bird Studies Canada. And what it is, is it's only four days during the year, and those four days in the middle of February. So the next bird count will be February 16th to the 19th, 2018. And during those four days, you can count birds anytime, anywhere. Um, and the nice thing is it doesn't have to be a backyard. It can be a schoolyard, it can be at a park, um, it can be from a window just looking at birds at a feeder. You can count as long as you want, um, it has to be a minimum of 15 minutes, but you can do multiple counts if you like over the days as well. Now that February lesson in Feather Friends is a starting point, a really great um, opportunity for educators to start their bird unit, work on some of their bird identification, and build up to um, doing a bird count for the Great Backyard Bird Count, which is wonderful. If you're interested in going even further with the concept of feeding birds and citizen science, another great project that we offer is Feeder Watch. That online interactive I showed you about um, your location and the type of seed and the type of feeder, that all came from Project Feeder Watch. Now, Feeder Watch is done during the feeding season and it actually starts this Saturday. Last Saturday. Sorry, it starts last Saturday. So Feeder Watch just began. It's not something where you have to participate during the entire season from start to finish, but it does um, require a little more engagement. Uh, the scientific protocol for feeder watch is that you have to observe birds on two consecutive days. This structure of feeder watch is actually found to be a lot more beneficial for teachers, classroom teachers, who are really looking for that structure and form. And it does come with a full guidebook and instructions on how to participate. And it also comes with a full bird identification poster as well to look at what your common feeder birds are. If you are interested in Feeder Watch, um, this is our only citizen science project that does have a fee because um, we send you the instruction book and the bird ID book. It's only $18, it's $15 if you are a lab member. Um, and Kelly has already shared the Feeder Watch link in the chat window. Again, though, Feeder Watch has a whole wealth of online tools that are completely free to access. It's just if you want to actually contribute the data, that's where the fee comes in. So when looking at Feathered Friends, we've kind of talked about a few different themes, but they go from a range of flight and migration, our new, completely brand new lesson that's in Feathered Friends, all around conservation. Um, we have citizen science in there, we have habitat in there, we have bird diversity throughout it. And so it's really focused on trying to teach a diversity of science content and just using birds as the tool for it. Now, through this webinar, we've gone through the stages of making that first nature connection. And that nature connection came from just observing birds at the feeder, doing a lot of these one-off activities that are within Feather Friends. Then we transition in how you can start to use a little bit of citizen science. Again, looking at the great backyard bird count, maybe even participating in feeder watch. But from there, we also touch on how you can conduct um, inquiry investigations. And specifically, there's one activity on conducting feeder investigations. 
Now we introduced this concept of an I wonder board in Feather Friends, where it has you as the educator identify a space um, where students can freely record their questions that naturally arise during class time as they're watching birds. Now this can be in the form of a journal or as we have pictured here in the form of a designated space on a wall or a blackboard where kids can just simply post post-it notes as the questions arise to them. The nice concept about this I wonder board is you as an educator don't have to know the answers to everything and don't have to answer everything right away. Instead, it provides a, a I don't want to say dumping spot, but a holding area um, for all these really wonderful questions that kids ask, but you either, again, don't know the answer to or don't have time to answer right away. Instead, what we do with this feeder investigation is we encourage you, uh, you to have your students or as a class go back to the I Wonder Board and review those questions and start figuring out how can we develop our own feeder investigation. So I want to give you one feeder investigation that was done, and this was done by Amy, who was a fourth grader, and she made observations in her backyard uh, at her bird feeder that when her neighbor's cat would come into her yard, it would scare all the birds away. So she couldn't tether her cats, her neighbor's cat to the tree. So instead she decided to just ask the question, well, would a fake cat scare away birds? And so Amy decided to test this question. For one week, she had the bird feeder out, measured the seed that was consumed. And then for a second week, she had the fake cat out and again, measured the seed that was consumed. And what she found was that without a fake cat present, three and a half cups of seed were eaten. But with a fake cat there, only half a cup of seed was eaten. And with these results, Amy um, made the conclusion the cat is a good guard. And we actually uh, published her study a few years back in our student publication magazine, Birth to the Investigator. Now, what's great about this investigation is that Amy didn't stop there. She really treated this like a full science. And she said, you know, the cat is a good guard, but I thought the birds would learn the cat was fake. So she made the prediction that over time the cups of seed eaten would increase because the cat uh, the birds would become accustomed to the fake cat and this is that extended learning um, and thought process we really want to focus on with inquiry now what i love about amy's experiment not just the fact that she went further was you don't have to be a bird id expert to do these feeder experiments yes we introduce bird identification within feathered friends but it seems we've worked with a lot of educators who are very concerned about using birds as a teaching tool because they can't identify them. Amy's experiment is a really wonderful opportunity for the elementary age group to build other skills, other measurements, other um, practices while not being stressed about having to identify every single bird that visits a bird feeder. Another great example it, uh, are these, I believe they were kindergarten or first grade students uh, who are studying the effect of snow depth on bird counts. Again, they didn't have to identify birds at all. They just had to be able to count the number of birds that visited their bird feeder and then also measure the depth of snow. So there are really great opportunities for youth to study birds and do these feeder investigations without uh, the stress of having to be able to identify every single bird that visits your area. Now, throughout this whole process, what this will lead to is, again, having kids first take off those bird blinders, make that natural connection to the local environment, hopefully leading to the opportunity to participate in citizen science. And if your students have really got on board with this, then going further into the investigation aspect of things. Woo, 10 minutes of spare for questions. Um, I see the chat window has been crazy active. Kelly, were there any questions that have come up that 
I should be addressing right away. Oh, excuse me. I think I got on top of most of them. Okay. So right now what we'll do, you guys are welcome to put any questions in the chat window if you like. Um, for our webinars, all of our webinars, you are welcome to at any point in time um, email us with any questions at all. Kelly and myself monitor the chat window, or not the chat window, the um, email address, Bert's with at cornell.edu. And um, between the two of us, we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. We also offer uh, letters of completion for attending this. So if you do need any form of uh, professional credit that doesn't need to be over the top professional, it's just a simple letter, states what the learning objectives were, were the one hour contact, um, signed and dated, we can also provide that as well. Okay, I'm seeing the chat window coming through. Thank you guys so much. How do you become a member? Kelly's gonna be sharing that link right now in the chat window. And many of you guys, um, if you do need a completion letter, instead of letting us know in the chat window, I forgot to say this, please email us, birdsluth at cornell.edu. Um, what that is, that's just so that we can keep track of everything. Carla, so what it is, is we unfortunately, with shipping costs, it's a flat rate $6. And that is set because UPS ships to um, organizational addresses, or uh, I guess organization is the right word, organization or business addresses for $6. It's actually more expensive to ship to a residential address. So if you can have your bird feeder if you're a homeschool educator, one option is to actually have your home be considered a business, so to say. That's something that you have to take up with UPS. If you do have an organization that you can ship the feeder to, then you can ship that, and that's perfectly fine. I hope that made sense, Carla, and if it doesn't, just email me <laughs> yes so if you do have a co-op that is out of business you're welcome to have the feeder shipped there are there any other questions yes so global citizen science pamela i'm actually doing a webinar tomorrow night there is a full global community education type conference that's happening um, and I'm doing a whole webinar on that. Our two global citizen science projects are um, eBird and the Great Backyard Bird Count. So as far as talking to others in different countries, there's less communication, I would say, about talking between each other because it's really focused on getting accurate data into the database. That said, there are some really active um, Facebook groups around there. If you are also wanting to work globally, um, Journey North, it's focused on monarchs, but Journey North is a great citizen science project that also focuses on global education. And the other thing I would think of is our bird cams. We do have bird cams in several different countries, and they also seem to have an active chat window sometimes. Um, and so that may be another global connection too. Alan, how did the two of us get into our careers and what struck our interests? Did you just respond to that a little? Uh, not yet, no. Okay, um, I actually am originally marine science by trade. Uh, I grew up in the beaches, well, I actually grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, where there's no water at all, so I was fascinated by water when I did go see the ocean, and am a certified diver, have studied um, microbiology of fish and anemones and a whole bunch of stuff, and I am a graduate of Cornell University. However, Cornell University, there's not much marine stuff here in Ithaca. And so as a student, I started working at the Cornell lab because it was the only environmental education I could find. And lo and behold, I got a 
bird bug, and I've since been here. She got bit by the bird bug. Kelly, on the other hand, though, has always been a birder by heart. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm a certified bird nerd. Uh, I wanted to be a Disney princess growing up because they always had birds coming to them and landing on them and singing to them, and I wanted that. So I ended up in bird research for a number of years uh, in my undergraduate career and after I graduated. But while I was working in Trinidad, a hummingbirds got inspired to look into environmental education, and I've been on that path since. Okay. Um, can we order more than one feeder? <sighs> you answered that already, okay. Um, thanks for your information. I'm going to share what I learned my elementary teachers in our fifth grade. Uh, Missy, this webinar is being recorded, so you're always welcome to share the recorded webinar as well. We are also offering this webinar again Thursday night. Uh, Pamela, if you are looking for global stuff, I know the communication, if that's going to be vital, we don't necessarily provide that. However, we do have these really amazing eBird STEM models, and those are actually used in um, the Feathered Friends curriculum. They're eBird STEM abundance models, and what Kelly can do is share the link to those in the chat window because she's at my beck and call right now. <laughs> and that's a really great visual. Um, to show how birds are moving at a global level. Um, obviously, we're focusing specifically on these between the movement of North America and South America, um, but that's a really great, great opportunity. Uh, Namale, do you have videos for students that can be found online? He's actually saying more informative videos. On birds. Okay, so several things that you can do um we have four videos the inside birding videos and that's solely focused on bird identification however they are really fun we also have a bird academy and bird academy is specifically focused on online interactive learning so they have a whole series of modules on feathers on bird song on evolution on anatomy and embedded within those as well are not only interactives and text reading but also online videos too. And you should check out the Cornell Lab of Ornithology YouTube page. Yep. So if you are specifically looking around content that if you have a specific content in mind, you can just email us to let us know and we can send you links to relevant videos. But those would be, um, I think Academy, Bird Academy would be the best starting spot for you. And Kelly shared that link in the chat window. It's academy.allaboutbirds.org. Wow, what was that, Kelly? It was supposed to be the link for the YouTube for Cornell, but I got it through Google without opening the YouTube, so it didn't go so well. Um, We're trying again. Yeah. Pamela is asking, um, Robin seemed to be in decline. Is it decline in population or loss of habitat? Yes. <laughs> right. Kelly just got interested. So uh, there has been a fairly steady decline in neotropical birds over the last 30 plus years. Um, you see it a lot more with migratory birds, but robins are partially migratory, so uh, they're their populations likely are in decline. I know in certain regions of the United States they are, because I've seen that on some of our maps. Yeah. And habitat loss, I mean, when in doubt, yes. It is the number one contributing factor to bird population decline. Absolutely. All across North America, so. Wow, you guys are such a question of group. I love it. Does anybody else have any other questions? And oh, I'm going to jump in here really quick because I was thinking about population declines across the um, across the eastern U.S. in particular, and most of those trends were detected thank you to citizen science data, like the Christmas bird counts. Um, and Project Peter Watch detected population declines in the evening grosbeak. So citizen science data is really really vital to answer conser conservation questions like that. So Pamela is asking, what can we do to help robins? Nesting platforms from Nestwatch. I was going to say, and that's exactly what I, where I know specifically they state that robin populations are declined. Um, I'm going to show this live feed, but um, 
we'll also Kelly will also share the link in the chat window. So what it looks like here, let's go to Nest Watch real quick. Nestwatch.org. Uh, again, we have a really great learn tab, and there's stuff around common nesting birds, all the birdhouses, but there's one interactive called Right Bird, Right House. So for us, we are again in, um, let's find you, the Northeast, and our habitat, let's say, is open woodland. Does that look all right, Kelly? Yeah. To so open woodland, see results. Woo, right there, front and center, American kestrel, American robin species in decline in this region. So it's really nice about Nestwatch. Um, it will tell you the difficulty of building um, the nest plot from one to three. It'll also tell you if it's kid friendly or not. And so you can see this plan. Um, right now it's showing the species is in decline in the Northeast um, and Southwest and in the Pacific region but it'll also give you all the details you need for the nesting box as well and helpful tips. So we also had a question about, is there one species that's more in decline than another? And that varies wildly from species to species. Um, again, the ones that are usually in the most decline, and I feel like this is a pretty safe statement, are our migratory, our new tropical migrants. Um, their migration is just an incredible challenge because one, it's very taxing for the birds, but two, it requires uh, not just that they have habitat for their breeding grounds, but they have habitat for their wintering grounds and places to stop on the way in between. So there's all these other points that they get hit harder than birds that are residential birds. Um, also, cowbirds are an issue for a number of birds, so our smaller uh, migrant migrants like warblers there are a number of them that are in severe decline yeah and and this is really good for us to talk about because it's not focusing on you know is one species more important than the other uh, within the last year last couple years for you guys who are concerned about bird populations I would recommend looking at the state of the birds report um, it is a report that's developed every couple years or so through a collaboration of multiple organizations, including the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, but it's a comprehensive report um, using independent data that is trying to assess bird population statuses um, throughout North America. Now, one of their themes within the last few years was not just um, conserving endangered populations, but reflecting back on case studies such as the passenger pigeon and focusing on keeping common birds common as well. So I think that's just always something to keep in mind too. Uh, Mary's asking, what's webinar be available to view after tonight? Absolutely, we've been recording it this entire time and we will post it on YouTube um, afterwards. Christine, the link Kelly just shared with you is really helpful. We also have um, the house finch and the purple finch as two birds in feathered friends as well. So I recognize you guys, it's past seven o'clock. Kelly and I are happy to stay here a little longer and continue to at, answer questions. Um, do you guys, what is your, oh yes, let me get back on that page again. Again, here's our contact information. Uh, Kelly, I'm sure is going to come up with something witty real quick and say, you should totally talk to me on social media. So find us on Facebook or Twitter. They call it social media, but it's actually kind of lonely. So please at me. I apologize for any of our regulars who have heard that every single time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do this every single month. Um, please feel free to join us and become part of our regular club. Um, <laughs> we like saying hi to all of our regulars. Uh, Vanessa, good to see you again. Our YouTube channel, um, we have, if you just search the corner. I did link to it, but it was a funky link. Let me see if I can get it a better one. Hang on, we're bringing that on, and or bringing that to come in, or whatever that word I'm trying to say. I don't know what you're trying to say. I don't know. It's late, yo. <laughs>
Yes, we hope you guys are going to join us for the summer educator retreat. That is a lot of fun. It's so much fun. It, everybody who does our educator retreat, woo, they, they're loving it. So We love it too. Yeah, so not sure how to access this webinar from YouTube. What you can always do, when in doubt, just email us, birdsuth at cornell.edu. And our retreat, okay, so the Educate Retreat is here at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York. It is July 18th through the 21st. Are those dates correct? It is. Awesome, 2018. Dorm housing is available. And, well, okay. I don't know if it's available starting now, but we will make it available shortly. Um, as far as how early the retreat books up, you have quite a few months. It probably won't book up until, you know, May time period. It's really hard to say. April, May is when it starts getting last minute. Yeah. Um, if you're looking about funding options as well, we do have a scholarship available. They're limited funds. We cannot guarantee providing you funds, but there is a scholarship. Kelly's going to reshare the um, link to the retreat, and that has a link at the very bottom of the page for the scholarship as well. Come hang out with us and see how goofy we are in person. Yeah, if you guys think we're crazy on webinars, imagine us for four days. With early birding and late night extravaganzas at the lab. <laughs> no, it, it really is a lot of fun. This retreat is going to be focused specifically on inquiry and citizen science and how you can really foster those um, authentic learning opportunities between the two of them. Oh, thank you, Barbara. <laughs> oh, yes. You know, Christy, I will say, I may have put in a favor for some of my friends who are obsessed with bird cams and they were able to actually fill the bird cam feeders and get on camera. So I can't guarantee anything, but if you do happen to come, there is a small chance we can make it work. <laughs> Yeah, that's how the other people reacted to. Put it this way, they have to fill the feeders every day and to them it's boring. When they have other people come in, they're like, yeah, you can fill it. Well, we hope you guys, for any of you, this is your first webinar, we hope that you come to future ones. Uh, our next webinar is going to be focused on literacy and um, well, I guess more literature, I should yes. say. ELA. ELA, making um, ELA stuff. Ooh, the bed cans. Kelly, bird cans, Link. Bird cans, I'm on it. <laughs> Kelly's going to share the bird cams link shortly. We have a whole series of bird cams available. So there's always a bird cams um, happening at some point in time. The next webinar is going to be in the middle of December. I think it's the 12th. Kelly's pulling up the link for it. It's all around it's on the 12th, and the 14th. 12th and the 14th. Again, it's going to be focusing on our book guides and um, looking at that. Okay. We're going to have to cut you guys off soon because I'm going to lose my voice very shortly. Oh, thank you.